moment where you can take notes of everything that's being said, but also you're going to get a lot of practical advice. I think people have a lot of theory, and you hear a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything if you don't know how to practically actually apply the things that have been told to you and said to you. Okay? So please make room for it. Unlearn the things that you've learned, and make room for learning new things that you're able to apply in your own lives. All right? Before I move on, we're gonna, um, I'm going to introduce the panels or the panelists who are going to be on stage with me. It's a beautiful melting pot of financial experts, but also people that you've fallen in love with, people that you know, people that you're able to connect with, people who speak your language, and hopefully hearing the conversation between um, these various individuals really sparks something in you. Uh, she is a lead specialist of research and also insights. Everyone, please help me welcome Zandi Makova. <laughs> Coming out to stage right now, behavioral scientist. Everyone, please make some noise for Shalia Naidu. <laughs> please help me welcome onto stage a franchise uh, principal as well as a financial advisor. Everyone, make some noise for Amanda. <laughs> All right, coming out to stage, lead specialist uh, of investment propositions. Everyone, please make some noise for. And I have to. I've been rehearsing this. Ruvani Mako. <laughs> All right, now for the young uh, uh, entrepreneurs and professionals, people that you're very familiar with, people that you've seen a couple of times before uh, and that we're very excited to have. One is very familiar to this, and if you saw season, how many of you actually saw season one? You saw it? All right. So this is someone who is very familiar to the space, a very personal somebody to me. And we actually went to primary school together, so this is many, many years of successes that we've gotten to witness. Uh, very honored to welcome her onto stage, founder and chief creative officer of Duma Collective, Sibu Havima Bena. We have fallen in love with all of his offerings. There's no way <laughs> you're going to hear or read anything from this individual and not laugh and not be tickled by anything he's had to offer. He's amazing, an incredible creative, a presenter, a comedian, an influencer. Everybody, please make some noise for George Okewasavi Mbuni. All right. It's fine, I'll come back to you. Uh, welcome onto stage, a very, very gorgeous lady, <laughs> a big boss, if you will, regional marketing manager uh, of Southern Africa for Powerplay and East Africa for Predator. Everyone, please make some noise for Seven Zile Mobo. <laughs> if you know anything about Bridge Entertainment, you know that they've done the craziest things, um, culture shifting things, and I don't know if this gentleman is brave or has no fear in him. But nonetheless, he's a game changer in more ways than one. And really, part of the reason that all of this is happening. Everybody, introducing to you um, entrepreneur and founder of Bridge Entertainment, Lerato Tili, come on to stage. <laughs> Oh, he was trying to run away from the whole thing. Oh, no, but it's not happening. When we were in, okay, so this is just like a humble, small little flex. When we were in Salt Lake City <laughs> for uh, the NBA All-Star Weekend, it was really interesting. It was so great hearing how people pronounce Laredo's name. It was what, what Laredo. Hey, Laredo. <laughs> um, I think maybe the first point of departure, I think it's, going to be really important for us to maybe speak from a very personal point of view. And I think it's very important for people to maybe gauge more from your experiences and the things that you've learned and come to understand in and around anything and everything that you know about the world of finances and financial literacy. Ultimately, we want to create a culture and an awareness between people who are really able to master the world of financial literacy, right? So also so that it's not a boring conversation, um, I think it's really important for people to know what your personal experiences have been so that they're able to connect those kind of dots and draw that level of inspiration back to themselves. You know, when you speak in financial terms, especially in a world where people don't understand it, it's so easy for people to disconnect from that. So 
if we can really give that, it, of course, your professional insight is what we're here for, but also your lived experiences, I think, hold so much weight and so much gravity. So if you can please speak from that point of view so that people are able to receive it from a very personal uh, 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 point of view so that they're able to apply everything that they learn here, right? I want to start with, and I think maybe I'll start with um, the yips. Okay, ne? to my right. These are our financial experts, yes? Okay, <laughs> okay and as well as Stephen Zillow, okay, who would also know? Who is in the business of entrepreneurship and as, as well as a professional. To my left are the yips, okay? So the yips are the young entrep entrepreneurs and professionals, okay? The conversation is not just for entrepreneurs, okay? I need you to understand that. We understand that whoever's watching at home and the people that are here in the room are maybe people who work in a professional space, maybe people who have just started their entrepreneurship journey, people who are on their way to really trying to gather as much information as possible. And hopefully this is a catalyst for, I guess, activating that entrepreneurship journey, but one that results in a, a very successful business, right? But I want to start with you guys. There's something that happens in your entrepreneurship journey or in your professional journey as you're trying to figure out whether you're trying to hustle and make sense of how to navigate the space. But there's a light bulb moment. There's an aha moment. There's something that really shifts and changes the gears and ultimately informs what the rest of your professional business looks like. Né? And I'll use myself as, as, a, as an example. Sibu, you would know this. Né? I start off as just a dancer, OK? Uh, and I just wanted to mimic and see everything that I saw in Step Up and Stomp the Yards. And I was a part of that crew culture. That was my thing. And I think when you're an entertainer or when you are an artist in that tier or in that level, you don't, you have dreams and aspirations, but you're not really sure how to articulate or to make sense of that space. Because you're even trying to make sense about whether dance is even an industry. Can you even pursue this space? What are the possibilities in it? Are there tiers? How do I work myself up the ranks, right? So I was just a dancer, fine, moved up, learned how to be a, a, a choreographer, and then you get into the performance director space. But also I was the type of girl where, I mean, I turned 18. After I turned 18, I made a commitment that I would not ask my mom for money, okay? A matriarch led home, three girls that my mom was raising all on her own. I go to school at the University of Johannesburg, apply for a degree. My mom has no money for it, so what do we get? A student loan. We're sitting in the offices, and I'm making this commitment to my mom, and I'm saying, no, ma, I'm going to pay the student loan. Over the four years, whatever we've accumulated over those years, I promise I'm going to pay it back. Now, this is a very confident 18-year-old <laughs> who really has no idea how she's going to achieve it, but I really wanted to do it. Okay. And after I had graduated, it took me about three years to pay it off. Okay? But I eventually paid it off, which is fantastic. Thank you. But how did I pay it off? Thank you. <laughs> but how I managed to pay it off was I was, maybe this is where the multiple streams of income side of me uh, was activated. I became a promoter. So I was that girl who you see, you go to a garage and someone is handing flyers to you and you're earning 40 rand an hour, that was me. <laughs> I did it. Um, and then I became a field manager. Uh, I worked in the office. And no disrespect to anyone who works in the office, I did it for two months. And it was the worst two months of my life. <laughs> because I'm just not, I'm not built or designed that way. Okay? Nonetheless, I'm trying to prove a point. I'm trying to get my degree, but I'm also exploring all these other possibilities, trying to get money from as many different avenues. And now I'm trying to grow and establish myself within the entertainment landscape. I'm trying out different things. Now I'm trying to be an actor. Now I'm trying to be a presenter. Now I'm trying to diversify my pool. But now the problem is, I'm the creative, I'm the talent, I perform my work, but I'm also trying to do the business side. I'm self-managed. I'm trying to PR and market myself. And at a, at a point, something happens where something suffers. So just because you can do multiple things, it doesn't mean that you should. Because it's just not the best use of your time or the best time of your resources, right? 2020, 
I'd signed to Stalo. Now, if you know anything about Stain Entertainment, uh, are you guys familiar with Rocky and the Daisies? Yeah? Okay, so Stain Entertainment um, has many other eventing properties as well, but very successful. I've been doing it for multiple years. And they've got Stalo Management, which is uh, a record label, as well as uh, an artist management. And I signed with them back in 2020. We had a conversation about how I wanted to establish myself and what I felt I needed to do, because I understood that I needed structure, okay? And I needed to partner with people who understood what structure looked like and how they could bring structure to whatever my artistic expression was. How are we able to monetize it? What can we do? And that, for me, really changed the trajectory of my entrepreneurship journey in the multiple ways that I've diversified myself. More so, when Dale DeRay, and I'm going to give him, I'm really going to give him all the credit for this. We had a conversation and he said, listen, we're going to, we're going to sell at Dog Studios, we're going to do it. We're going to create an entity, a body, a business that exists in, within your name, but it's a business that is absolutely necessary. And that for me completely changed. Now, I'm having conversations and I'm hearing things about p &Ls and forecasting and you know, and it's like, what does this even mean? And going to something knowing that you're going to be working at a loss, but working every single day to try and gather a level of, uh, of success many, many years to come, um, it's a very interesting journey because you also understand the people that you're responsible for, the people that you employ, people need to go home, this, that, and the fit. But again, without me rambling and saying too much, my entrepreneurship journey, especially when Winter Mugi Sela uh, Dance Studios was birthed, really changed how I engaged my entire life and everything that comes with it. So I'm going to speak to you guys, and maybe you guys can briefly um, explain when the switch happened for you. What was that one thing? What was that one, e if it's even one? Tilly, maybe I'll start with you. In your many years. Many, 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 many years. Okay. What was that one thing that said to you, uh, yeah, this is it. This is the light bulb moment, and uh, this is your pivotal moment of significant change in your entrepreneurial journey. Um, so <clears throat> just to respond to that, man, um, for me, it's, it's a collection of things, right? Um, it's not one particular incident, um, but the leading one above all is just the desire and, and uh, just to pursue what I at the time believed my calling was. Um, and it's not because I woke up feeling like this is my calling. It's just every day what I was naturally drawn to, whether I made money from it or not, it didn't matter. I just wanted to keep on doing that. Look, I used to work at um, an internet uh, um, service provider. Um, I started off in the call center and I ended up as a network engineer, um, which has got nothing to do with what I studied, by the way. But the reason I'm that significant to my story is because I used to lie at, uh, on my lunch break and say, I'm going to the bank to, I've got a meeting with my bank. At that time, I'm earning 4K. I don't know <laughs> if you can get a banker, but, um, and then I take a lot longer doing what it is that I was passionate about, you know. Shame, my bosses were understanding, and they knew what I was doing, you know. Um, so that drove me to wanting to do more of that, and naturally, um, at the point where it seemed sensible for me to, to drop what it is that was uh, considered secure from an earning perspective, I then decided to go to, go to that. And by the way, um, it's not because I had this lump sum saved up. It's because I had this plan that was heavily, heavily embedded in me. So I didn't leave my 905 because I had money. I left my 905 because I had it in my heart. And it didn't make sense at the time um, and even, even uh, the artists that I work with will tell you, when I went to him and told him that I'm going to pursue this thing full time with him, he was like, you are crazy. <laughs> I, I mean, he was charging about 800 rand for performance at the time. And I wasn't even taking anything at the time from him because I had my salary, however little that it was. Or at that time, it, it, it was significant enough. But he was like, no, you can't do that. And all I had from my retirement, whatever you want to call it, was three months worth of living. And uh, I think I blew that within the first month. Um, I don't know how much I blew at pace. Maybe I could get some money for that. But I, I, 
Yeah, so it wasn't because I had money saved up. Within the first month, I didn't have money for rent. I didn't have money for transport. But that didn't slow the, pro uh, the, the, the process down at all. So for me, it was a collection of a series of events. Perhaps I should have spoken to the experts. They would have given me better advice. But I literally chased my passion. But at the time, it wasn't because I am telling myself I'm chasing my passion. It was genuinely because this thing is instilled in me, and I just want to do that. That's all I want to do. And it transpired into other areas. Look, I come from a background. My mom was an, was an entrepreneur. Music has been embedded in me since... You know, as a kid, we used to own a sound system back when I was a kid. I used to go with my family when they setting up sound, renting it out to multiple events and clubs and weddings, etc. My brother introduced me to hip hop, etc. So I grew up with that. But the business side of it, outside of it being driven from my mom, seeing her being an entrepreneur and selling sweets as a kid, I'm sure we all did that, right? Uh, well, most of us did that at soccer games and stuff. I used to do that, sell peanuts when I was about seven or eight at soccer games. So that has been instilled in me as I grew, but to pursue my passion, that was just a natural order progression. Mm. Yeah. Sybil, for you? Uh, <laughs> my <laughs> check. <laughs> Do you think? Um, so mom, nine to five, dad, entrepreneur, um, and then my sister was an entrepreneur as well. My, my brother has been a teacher since 1991, the day I was born, he's been teaching. Uh, right up until now. So I've got the exposure of what the security of a of, of having the discipline of working for someone else, but the money coming come on me on the 30th of the month, and then the discipline of having to wake up and work for yourself, and if you don't work, you're not making any money. So I think being in that space, um, I then morphed into this super crazy workaholic, <laughs> which is what Tilly calls me of someone who's been doing many, many, many things for many, many, many years. There was a point where I was at school studying politics at the University of Victoria. I was a bartender at the Sands of Sandton. I was a performance director working with one day on many different shows. I was a promoter. Um, I think my first trip to London was doing promo games yeah. at Mabonya Mall. Standing <laughs> with someone on my mind. That was that with me. Um, um, I was doing a research project for a company called Global Access because I have experience doing research for my assignments at school, but I was also doing voiceovers for this Global Access company. And they were like, hey, you study politics. We're doing a documentary on the legislature. You have uh, some information, some experience. So in the five days a week, actually seven days a week, in the 24 hours a day, in the 365 days a year, I was utilizing a lot of those minutes and hours to generate some revenue for myself. I started earning money when I was 16 years old as a choreographer teaching kids, earning 10 rand an hour per child, but I was actually teaching 24 kids an hour. So that money accumulates. I started earning money at a very young age and respecting it because I've also seen my father go from having lots of it to having none of it. Because in business, things happen. Yeah. I've also seen my mother go from you know, being in a marriage to being a single mom and having to now fend for herself with the salary that she's making being a government employee. So all of these exposures, I think, are what have contributed to me, me being, one, conscious of, if you don't work, you don't earn, <laughs> but two, respect money. Because if you don't respect the money, oh, then what are you working for? How are you going to take care of yourself? So it's, it's been that. Um, being a freelancer and doing all these cool things, professionalizing that high-level freelancing operation. That's the switch that happened for me. Or would see, I have to package myself as an entity and not as an individual. Because if I want to engage with companies, with corporations, then I'm probably going to have a better chance coming as a corporation. So a Duma Collective today, which is a creative communication agency that employs 49 people, that owns two buildings in Randburg, that is a blue chip company um, as, as retainer clients. Now when I go from one company and say, oh, I go to a company and I list my credentials, I say, look, a multi-choice has trusted us for the past three years. They continue to trust us for the next three years. Why shouldn't you? So that's the switch that happened in my mind. You see, I'm competing against many different individuals. 
But as a small business, I have a better chance of getting ahead faster so I can do more with more people and for more people. So um, I always say, I actually even said it to you guys as dancers. I think there was one session where it was time to pay people. And I said to everyone, we have to pay a higher tax for you. We have to pay performance tax and withhold, like withholding tax if we pay you as individuals. But if you come as a company, then you invoice the full amount and you deal with your tax yourself. And that was me trying to encourage people with the information that I had because I was a freelancer in my experience and I was told the same thing by Global Access that if you invoice as a company, then we don't withhold the tax, then you don't have to do the admin of IRP and all of that. So just come as a company. So I registered a business and it was so easy. You register a company at FNB, you, excuse me, Standard Bank, very sorry, but any bank that you go to, you register for the company there, you get a business bank account, you get your tax clearance, you get a BE affidavit, you can download it off of the internet, and you just get that certified. And boom, you have a company, and you're able to now engage other companies, company to company. So that's one of the switches, but the bigger one was that as a company, I have better opportunity, or I have, a, I have more opportunity um, engaging with companies as a company. And I think maybe the third other switch, maybe, was being in that Harvard room. I mean, that's not. That's like <laughs> yeah, ago, yeah, but it informs what the future um, and holds for you. So I think there, the gears for you are changing also dramatically. Yes, I think it, so I attended um, a four-day program called the Business of Entertainment, Media, and Sports at Harvard Business School. And in the class were 77 entertainment sports and media executives from different companies ranging from uh, Paramount to YouTube to Meta and even sports professionals like Juan Mata, um, you know, people who've been in the business of this entertainment and media thing we do. And just the insights that come from those people, just the conversations that you're having with those people and the professors who um, came in with all the knowledge and the information around how the business of entertainment is actually structured. I think what the next 50 years will be like is that of someone who's going to try to champion the professionalization of the creative industry that we find ourselves with. Because what we experience today in this South Africa, in this economy, um, with all this opportunity, our Amapiano artists are in Portugal right now, so much happening in Afro Nation. We're seeing all the content coming back into the country, we're excited. But what does that mean for the future of the music industry in South Africa? If you look at the corporations, um, the record labels, they're able to be successful because they have corporatized creativity. Whereas our artists haven't necessarily gotten to a stage where they've unlocked that you've got to corporatize. You've got to put systems and structures in place so that as a key man in your business, as the artist, as the bunte, how, how does the business function when you are on stage? What is happening to the business when you are preparing to be on stage, when you're busy in, in doing your choreo or being um, in rehearsal or you're doing your creative session, somebody has to be chasing the invoice. Somebody has to be signing or reading the contract. Someone has to be signing the contract. Because at the end of the day, if you don't corporatize this thing that we have this big opportunity to do, someone else is going to do it. In fact, they are already doing it. So we have a lot of catching up to do as creatives, as um, professionals in the creative industry for us to get to a level where we can say we are in control of this thing that's so precious to us and is able to do exceedingly abundantly than what we can think of today. I mean, if you're not inspired by Sue, I don't know what is wrong with you. Uh, so, Vinzile, let me bring it to you. In your professional journey, uh, when did that switch happen for you? I think the switch will continue to happen to me as my C to C changes every time I move up the corporate ladder. But I think, you know, for me, my, my, for me, you know, I was always very clear that I'm going to be a corporate girl. Okay, I have so much respect for entrepreneurs, but I do not have the knack for it at all. So I always knew that I was going to be a corporate girl. Studied at Wits, you know, followed the traditional, you know, way of how we we you know move up in corporate. And I think my first encounter, the first switch that I had as a young professional was um, I was taking a taxi. I, I worked at Multitrace as a junior research analyst. And um, it's my first job. And I'm in a taxi. I ring, I'm wearing a back. And I'm wearing like these white pants. 
and um, I'm in a taxi, and unfortunately, in that particular taxi, it was dirty. The taxi driver was so rude. I was so upset, guys. And I looked at myself and I said, what is a girl with two degrees so beautiful for going actually doing, needing to like deal with this, the rudeness of this taxi driver, deal with this dirty taxi? I'm buying a car. It was an impulsive decision. I got into the office, started phoning my bank. You know, I'd say, I'm buying a car, I need a car. What do I qualify for? Now, mind you, I have never, growing up, we never had financial conversations around the dinner table. Um, I was, you know, we were never really having those conversations within our family structures. What you knew about purchasing an asset, what you knew about financial management was ever you acquired for yourself. Because even university, they didn't really teach you that, you know. So, um, impulsive decision, the bank says to me, unfortunately, Sissy, with what you're earning, you don't qualify for the vehicle that you want. I'm like, I don't qualify. You know, um, and then I called around because I knew some people. My next door neighbor was a, owned a dealership. I called him like, Uncle so and so, um, I need a vehicle, you know. And uh, he managed to speak to my bank and I purchased a car. Okay, and I was super excited. Um, I go tell my dad, and I'm like, Dad, guess what? I purchased a car. And my dad's like, You, you did what? Who did you ask? He's like, have you signed the contract? I'm like, no, I'm signing the contract on Friday. He's like, take that car back. He's like, you're not, you're like, what, what make, and I thought to myself, oh, okay. Um, I didn't listen because I'm stubborn, I'm a Zulu girl. I went and I purchased the vehicle. Now, now I'm being bombarded with all of these questions about insurance and, the in, and what my interest rate is and how much I'm paying back. And in my mind, I'm like, I just thought it was as simple as buying a car, I'm paying my 8,000 rand installment, let's just move on with life. You know, and I am bombarded with all of these questions and I'm asked, I'm signing a document that I don't know that's like tying me to this contract for the next whatever, five years or however long the term was. And I think for the first time in my life, I had to sit down and be like, okay, this is what I'm earning, this is what I'm buying, this is what I can afford. And I had to sit down and for the first time in my life, draw up a spreadsheet and figure out what does financial management actually mean as a young professional. Now, this has changed obviously over the years. I've been in the game now for 11 years. And, you know, as I've pur purchased new things, you know, did new things and learned a little bit more about financial literacy and the different products that financial institutions offer that help me as a young professional to grow my portfolio, um, to have long-term sustainability and, you know, all of that stuff. You know, a lot has changed, but, you know, that first encounter for me just made me realize that it's, it's not that simple and planning is important. Um, impulsive decisions are impulsive decisions. Make the impulsive decision, but after that have a plan because if you don't plan, then you plan to fail. Ooh, ooh. You know what I mean? Take it, take it. You guys got it, right? And I think a lot of us have done that. We've made very impulsive decisions. Um, but also on your journey to hustling, I think that fake it till you make a thing, you kind of try to apply it, you try to look like the success you're going for, and you catch many hours along the way, and then you realize that you've <laughs> almost dug a grave for yourself. But I mean, you find your ways to get out of it, right? Um, Wasabi, or George, since we're having a serious conversation. I don't know which one, okay? Um, we know you as a comedian, you make us laugh. You um, are a creative, uh, you know, a content creator. We see the work that you do online. Um, but now we wake up to you every single morning. We listen to you on the radio. So being a freelancer, and now you have a job. Yeah. In your professional journey, for you, where is that switch? Where, what does that feel like to you? How are you realizing um, your journey? How do you perceive it, actually? How do you, how do you see your journey? Um, um, testing or oh, Nayoge. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, that's the most recent uh, switch that you just mentioned, actually. But uh, I've had quite a few switches because I'm in, a, I'm in an industry which did not exist 15 years ago. Uh, when I started, I started in 2012, and there was no such thing in South Africa as influencer marketing, really. I was doing videos just to make people laugh. I think the first time somebody uh, hit me up, uh, I think it was in the, a year into my career, somebody hit me up, they're like, do you want to make a video for this brand? I was like, sure. I was prepared to do that video for free because, 
You know, as long as I'm being acknowledged, for me, that's currency enough. These, this huge company that's been around for many years is actually wanting to collaborate with me. Uh, but then they were like, please invoice us. And I was like, oh my God, what is an invoice? So I had to Google that. This is like a year after high school, even I was 19. Google an invoice, get a, a template and stuff like that. And um, it was 3,000 Rand. And that's, I'm a millionaire. Three, oh, <laughs> 3,000 Rand, I, I couldn't find enough chucks to buy. I'm a Chuck Taylor engineer. Yo, but then I invoiced that and that was the beginning of making uh, income with something that I was doing purely for fun with friends. Yeah. Like it was just uh, doing it for laughs, the LOLs, the likes and comments on, on social media. And then when that first paycheck came through and I was like, I, I got paid for doing this using my phone in my backyard. That's crazy. Now, a couple of years later, the scale of payments that, I've, that I get now or five years ago compared to that 3,000 Rand was a huge switch where I realized, Guti, you know what? Now, this is a different uh, ball game. Because I tried, I remember in that year when I got first paid, I was just on a gap year because I really wanted to create content. I told my, I convinced my mom, oh, lady, Guti, I'll try gap year. I'll return to school the following year. But as soon as I realized, Guti, this can be a career, because there was no such thing as making videos and getting paid for that every single month. As soon as I realized, Guti, wait, this thing can uh, actually uh, be an, a consistent income. That's when I realized, Guti, you know what? I can do this full time. And the decision to make it full time, to drop out of uni uh, twice, because I did try twice, just to make sure that my parents can see, Guti, this is not my thing. I did accounting at UJ, and I even went to do uh, TV at ATV in SABC. And I told them, Guti, uh, this thing, it's fine, it's nice for other people, but it's not me. I want to uh, make this thing a full-time career. And it was such a risk, because like I said, this industry is very young. You don't know what you're gonna do. Social media is so fickle. All it takes is one tweet or one video to break down your, who you are, and then now brands <laughs> distance themselves from you. So every single day that I'm in this industry is a risk, because it only takes a, a night for you to lose your job, basically. So that's, the switch for me happened when I realized, okay, okay, you know what, this can be a stable income, but now, and I was doing it for many years like that, but now the second switch comes in where I used to chase people for invoices. There was months where my invoices were, were super late and I was super broke because they were like, oh, no, there's a delay, actually. The, your payments will get in in three weeks. But what am I supposed to do in those three weeks? Uh, because you were the only campaign I was depending on. But uh, now the, the, the new switch is a payment every end of the month. And I'm like, wow, nine to, nine to five people, you guys are living amazing lives. Because there's certainty. That bank notification every single month. You are sure that tweet wow. comes in. <laughs> Why didn't you guys tell me? I would have... I would have switched a long time ago. So I am still doing the influencer thing and stuff like that, sure. but it's that certain um, comfort or certainty that comes with, if I go to work every single day, uh, month end, there's something for me. Oh. And uh, more people trust me now also, like financial institutes, uh, oh. they trust me, they're, like, they're open to giving me things, they're open to loaning me stuff. Back then, when I came to the message, I do Instagram videos. They were like, ah, 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 no, let's not make sure. This, yeah, where's your pay slip? Where's, yeah, where pay? Yeah, they see what all oh, this guy paid you. This it's random payments on the eighth, on the sixteenth, on the twenty. Yeah, so it's it's a switch that I'm I'm getting comfortable with right now. Uguti, I'm more I'm seen more of a, as a professional, but also I found out ways on how to make my influencership thingy seem more viable with yeah. big business accounts, paying myself a salary hey. and things like that. So you learn with the, with, with the years that go by, you learn how to make an informal or new industry seem formal, but also being in this formal one where I get paid every single month is also like a, a breather also. So those are the switches that I've experienced in, throughout my career.